Good morning and welcome to FBC. Would you please stand and let's worship together. Voices, let's lift it up. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory. Lord. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates of night. Oh 
It's so good to see you this morning. So glad you're here with us. If this is your first time, uh, we're especially glad that you would choose to come and worship with us here. Uh, my name's Art, and I serve as the pastor here. It's a joy of my life uh, to serve you. I love you, and I'm so grateful that you're here. In the back of your bulletin, you'll find a thing that says uh, Connect Card, and we'd love to just to get to know you. We promise we won't come beat on your door or anything this week, but you might get an encouraging note. And um, if you'll take that, you can either put it in the offering uh, basket bowl when it comes by in a little while, or you can take it to the welcome desk out front. We have a special gift for you uh, today. We're so glad that you're here. On the back of that is a place that says prayer request. I know that sometimes in the summer, it's uh, easy for things to happen and kind of get lost in the shuffle. And so this is a way you can communicate with us uh, your prayer needs, and we pray for you and try to encourage you in that. So you can take that and you can put it in the offering um, bowls this past two or hand it to one of the ushers or bring it to me. Uh, our staff pray for you on Mondays and then we carry them with us all week long. We're uh, really grateful when you share with us. Just two quick things. On June the 30th, we'll be in one service at 1030 together. Uh, we're celebrating baptism that day, the Lord's Supper. Um, and as well, uh, we're uh, having patriotic celebration and a picnic and we're welcoming Sheriff Dave Phelan to come and preach for us today. He's not coming to make a political speech. He's not even coming to talk to you, give a talk. He's coming to open God's word and preach about the impact of the gospel in a community. And he sees the worst and the best. And uh, I'm so excited about that. I've had several of my pastor friends in town who he's spoken and preached for them. And um, and he, it will not be light. It will be hard hitting and um, God's really using him. He's used him in my life personally as I've gotten to know him, and I'm excited about that. We'll have chicken that day. You, we don't have chicken all the time here, but we do have chicken on that day, and there's a place here over the next couple of weeks just for us to get a bit of a count to know that you're coming and how many people you're going to bring, and we're going to honor first responders that day. So we're praying over uh, uh, firemen and policemen and sheriff deputies and uh, patrol people and EMS workers. We're going to pray over them to that day. And so we're in doing a special invitation for them to come. You want to be a part of it. Uh, some people opt out on special days. You don't want to opt out that day because you will miss it. Vacation Bible School is coming the following week, starting the 7th of July. And we'll go through that week. There's a table out here if you're interested in volunteering. Um, I was just looking over here at Carrie Horn. She's uh, working with food this year, and I just love how she keeps posting that and encouraging people to come. And I just want to tell you, if, if you'll share post, um, we've talked about that as a staff, so we're doing, if you'll share post like that, and all your friends see it, and uh, it makes a difference. And it could be that the friend who sees it and comes gives her life to Jesus. So be intentional uh, with that. Also, today, uh, we've been called as a nation to pray for our president today. And we want to do that here in just a moment. Um, we're, we're in 2 Timothy chapter 2 today. 1 Timothy chapter 2 says, I urge you, and, and, and Paul, the Apostle Paul says, I urge you to pray for those who are leaders and in authority. Didn't ask if you like them. Didn't ask if you agree with them. Said you're supposed to pray for them, uh, that God would work in their lives and they would uh, be good leaders. And we need that. Lord knows we need good leaders in our country and finally that we would pray for our brothers and sisters in the community around Dayton I was messaging with my pastor friend Chad Keck from Kettering last night and he said Art he says it seems like the rest of the state has just moved on from the tornadoes but he said we still have thousands and thousands with no power the homes destroyed and um, basic needs but water they just they need water. Can you imagine? Just needing water. And so um, as we pray for them, and we're praying about what God wants us to do uh, as far as helping in a tangible way and sending volunteers and financially, and so uh, we want to pray for them today. Um, your brothers and sisters on the other side of the state have incredible gospel opportunity in the midst of dealing with their own tragedies. Okay, let's pray together. Father. I thank you for your grace and your mercy, the gift of salvation that is in Christ Jesus. You are awesome and wonderful, God. 
You, you have power to change lives. You have power to change countries, nations. Your, your word says that you can move the hearts of kings like it was just a small stream you can redirect it so Lord we pray for our president today Lord um, the greatest need that he could possibly have is to know you as Lord and Savior and so God we pray for his life for his soul today God that you would draw him to yourself that if he doesn't know you that he would repent of sin and trust Jesus God that you would direct him that you would give him wisdom that he would seek wisdom from you and I pray that for all of our leaders for our governor Mike DeWine I, I pray for him today God would you direct his heart would you draw him to yourself Lord for our friends our brothers our sisters in the Dayton area we can see pictures and I've seen those um, God we're not living would you give us a burden for them um, that doesn't go away passively would you show us how to minister to them tangibly personally and I pray for those pastors today who right now are opening your word and giving hope from the only one who can give real hope I pray it would even in tragedy, that there would be an open door for the gospel today. And God, that even if in tragedy, difficulty and suffering, God, we know from the text we'll study today that the word of God and the gospel are not bound. So I pray that God, lives would be changed today for the sake of eternity. God, move in, in our midst today. God, in this place, in this room today, God, change us for having been in your presence. God, change us by the power of your word, by the power of the Holy Spirit. God, in this room today, God, I pray for those people who are standing with us right now who've never trusted Christ. That God, you would draw them to yourself and they would have courage and faith to trust Jesus today. God, not courage to try harder, but courage to surrender themselves to the one who gave all for us. We love you. God, you can move every mountain that is in our lives. Everything in our life that seems insurmountable. God, you can move it or you can help us cross it. You're an awesome, incredible God. You're our God. We're grateful to call you Father. And I pray this in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. God's greater, I got stronger, 
so grateful for the fact that your word says that if you are for us then there's no use of anybody being against us there's no one who can overthrow you we're so grateful for that victory in our life we declare that we understand that you are king you are lord you are lord of everything and god we understand that all that we have all that we are comes as a gift from you so even now as we prepare to give back God, we give of our tithes and our offerings. Uh, we, we give so that other people can know the name and the glory and the salvation that is in Jesus Christ alone. We give not because you need what we have, but because we need to give it. We declare our dependence on you. God, help us to be good stewards, visionary stewards who see lostness in our community and around the planet. May this not be a passive time for us, for you are king. You are king, and we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated.
you're good. Oh, let the King of my heart be the wind inside my sail, the anchor for the waves. Oh, He is my song. Let the King of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, He is my. Sing it again. Let the King of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, He is my. Let the King of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, He is my song. You are good. You're good. Oh, You are good. You're good. the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection. Then we will rise again. Jesus. I 
judging the defender, suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection. thank you. You are so good. In every season, no matter the difficulty, the pain, the trial, um, you're, you're so good. Help us to walk faithfully to finish the race. And I just pray that you bless Art as he comes to speak. And uh, just pour out your spirit on him. Uh, help us to not just be hearers, but doers, uh, to be transformed inwardly um, as we hear and apply the word. We love you. It's in your name. Amen. Thanks for worshiping. You may be seated. If you have a copy of the scriptures with you, I invite you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2. Last week we began a journey through this incredibly encouraging uh, letter from the Apostle Paul, who's sitting in a damp and dark jail in Rome, and he's writing to Timothy, his protege, who pastoring the church at Ephesus. Um, it's more than just instruction. It's personal. It's deeply 
uh, personal. In chapter 1, the Apostle Paul uh, provides streams of encouragement, multiple ways trying to encourage Timothy. Timothy's no longer a rookie pastor. Uh, he went to Ephesus when he was very, very young. He's no longer a rookie pastor. But what happens in our lives many times, even as we grow in our faith, we go through seasons of discouragement in our lives. And the Apostle Paul starts with encouragement for him. All of us go through those seasons where we need encouragement. All of us also, at times, go through seasons in our lives where we can get distracted. Life happens, and we can get easily distracted. And then there are those seasons in life where you just feel like you're living in a fog. I need to see some, yeah, I know what that means. I know what that looks like. I'm there, <laughs> you know. Uh, you, you, know you're, you know you're in one of those seasons where you're living in the fog when your secretary says, Pastor, you need to take a vacation. <laughs> Which happened to me a few weeks ago. And so um, you, you, all of us can, can get there. All of us go there at times. Here, here's the thing. The Apostle Paul is trying to help Timothy in the middle of being discouraged and distracted and maybe even living in a bit in a fog he's trying to help him by encouraging him first and then he's going to in chapter 2 talk with him and write to him about and to us about staying focused what are we supposed to focus on when it feels like everything's kind of a blur anybody ever live when life's feeling like a blur anybody just want to be admitted I'm there right now this you know, life just feels like a blur. And the Apostle Paul in chapter 2 is going to say, hey, when you feel like life's just a blur, when you feel like it's a fog, you need to stay focused. Now, like most people, um, Timothy needs pictures. Anybody in the room like do good with pictures? So he's going to give some pictures. What does it look like to be focus, to stay focused, to refocus your life on what's most important. Because if Satan can get you distracted or get your mind kind of foggy or if he can get you discouraged, he can get you to settle. He can get you to settle in your own life. Any, anybody ever just struggle with, I just feel like I'm settling? It's coming from over there somewhere. I'm not, it sounds like they're reading the scriptures, but I'm not really sure. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's just, I can get distracted pretty easily, <laughs> especially in the second service, right? Um, have any of you listened to the song that Casting Crowns uh, put out a couple years ago that says, we've been called to more than just an ordinary life? We've been called to more than just survive. We've been made to thrive. And for whatever reason, Timothy, this godly young man, this godly young man has, uh, has gotten discouraged and, and maybe gotten a little off track. And that's what happens when we get discouraged. Satan can get us off track. And the Apostle Paul encourages him. Now he's going to say, here's what you need to stay focused. Because we're not just in a race we're supposed to finish the race and we're not just supposed to finish the race to survive the race we're supposed to finish the race well and he wants Timothy to finish the race well I'll skip ahead the Apostle Paul is going to tell him what it feels like when he says at the end of 2 Timothy chapter 4 I fought the good fight kept the faith and I finished my course he's going to help him focus on being an invested devoted and enduring disciple maker a disciple making follower of Christ who finishes well verse 1 
We're going to do 13 verses today. So if you get through the first like 10 and you're like, man, he's got a lot left, we're just going to verse 13 today, okay? I want to share three things with you from the text. Verse 1, you, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. About a year ago, I preached a message on this text, just these first two verses, because um, this is the heart of what I believe God's called me to, to take what I've learned as I'm learning. It's, it's the text here. He's telling Timothy, don't just take what you've learned when you feel like you've arrived. Take what you've learned as you've learned from me, as you've learned from God. Take it and invest it in others. God does not work in reservoirs. You'll, you'll never see God, God's blessing described as a lake. It's always a river. It's a spring. It's something that flows through, not fl something that flows to. When God calls us to be disciple makers, he calls us to invest in others. So what that looks like is instead of holding your hands, looking for God to fill you up and make me a devoted follower of Christ, to make me an effective, thriving follower of Christ, it doesn't look like fill me up. It looks like flow through me. That's what it looks like. God can only put so much in a little cup. I love pasta. <laughs> Some of you are hungry, so it's like really hurting you that I'm saying that. But strainers, the water flows through. You pick it up and you let the water. You, you, we're supposed to be filters through which God pours his word, pours the gospel, and let it fall on others. We're not supposed to be reservoirs. Focus on the qualities of an invested disciple maker. He says here, you therefore are my son. The disciple making relationship is supposed to be deeply personal. Now you can't have deeply personal relationships with a hundred people. It's pretty well known that you can only have deep personal relationships with maybe a dozen people. That's why we focus on doing life groups to get you in a place where you have connections with people and you can know them and you can so that's what happened to me when I was in junior high and Irvin Campbell who didn't call me son because he had just he was a college student he had just recently graduated high school was a college student and Irvin Campbell was teaching to junior high and he would take me places and he would pour into me he would throw baseball with me. He would do different things with me and pour into my life. He didn't call me son, but he called me his friend. He invested in my life. And then there was Alvy Green. Al, Al, Alvy Green, I didn't even like fishing, but he would take me fishing. Sorry, Jerry. He, he, he would take me fishing. You know why I went fishing with Alvy Green? Not because I loved fishing, but because I wanted to hang out with Alvy Green. He poured into my life, and he did call me son. I know what that looks like, and I'm so grateful for those who would do that. The first person to ever share the gospel with me one-on-one -on -one, was Ruth Hankins, and she sat in my third grade Sunday school class and shared the gospel with me, kept me after class one day, and said, Art, I want to talk to you. And she called me son. There's something to it that's a discipling relationship is so deeply personal. But you know what happens when you get personal? It gets messy. You know why it gets messy? Sometimes we think about we don't want to get past the superficial relationship because it's messy, because other people's lives are messy. You know why other people's lives are messy? Why we see that? Because our own lives are messy. You wouldn't think it was messy if you didn't know what it looked like. Our lives are messy. And God still calls us to make investment deep investment. He, he says that we're supposed to be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. We, we know that our strength to have 
deep relationships with people, discipling relationships with people is only because of the grace of God. If it wasn't for the grace of God, you wouldn't know Jesus and you wouldn't know God's word and you'd have nothing to give. It's all about God's grace. And God brings us people into our lives only by his grace and he gives us through that grace, he gives us the ability to wade through the mess of their lives with them and allows them the grace to tolerate our mess too. And he said, where's that grace found? It's in Christ Jesus. Paul just keeps going back to Jesus. I was having a conversation with one of our church members after the first service. and They said, it's really interesting in their life right now. God's just really working in their life. And it seems like that God just keeps bringing people to sit and talk with them. And then does it really matter? It wasn't really any intent on anybody's part, but it just seems like right now most of the conversations they're having with people, even people they're just meeting, are turning and having something to do with Jesus. Duh. And, and Paul says that grace, that, that, that relationship revolves around the grace that's in Jesus. The message is not new. It always revolves around Jesus. Tony Marita says it this way, meditate on the gospel daily because you never outgrow your need for it. On those days when I don't feel like I have the energy to invest in someone anymore, I'm just worn out by them. You've got people in your life that just suck you dry. It, it, when, I, when I think about that, I just remember how hopeless and helpless I was without the gospel, without the grace of God in my life, and it gives me strength to keep pouring in. We need to be reminded of the gospel. Always be worried about someone who says, when you're talking about the gospel, that they want to go deeper. Always be concerned about that. You don't get any deeper than the love of God expressed in the Savior coming to die for you. You never get deeper than that. The method of Christ is modeled here in Paul's model with him that he then wants Timothy to do, to make substantial investment, to commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The word, some of your translations may say entrust. That word entrust or commit is the exact same word that in Luke chapter 23 Jesus used when he hung on the cross and said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This is no superficial committing. This is investment, an investment in eternity. And you're like, well, gosh, every time I start investing in people, man, I get hurt. They stab you in the back or they, they leave, whatever. It's just not worth it anymore. I don't have the energy anymore. You know how you, def how you find the dependable, faithful people that he's talking about here? You keep trying. You take somebody new to lunch. You go have coffee with somebody new. You stop by your neighbor's house, and you, you just, keep, just keep stopping, and you just, you just see how God works. And eventually, here's what happens. You find three, four, five, six people that God just really gives you an incredible insight in helping them on their spiritual journey. It's usually not a bunch. It's usually a few. And find those faithful ones. And they will suck you dry. But it's crazy. When they suck you dry, God just fills you back up. Because all you're doing is giving them Jesus. And what does God want to do? Give you more Jesus? He gives you more of his word to give to them. And God just challenges you and fills you up. And, lets you, and, and you, you sometimes get to the end of the day with some people. I had a, I had a guy like that one time that just seemed to suck me dry. And I'm like, man, he's just got so many questions. He just, and, and every day it was like, oh my, one more text. He's, what does this mean, Pastor? I don't understand this. What, what does it mean? And you, you, just, you just keep pouring in and pouring in and pouring in and pouring in. And it's like, just when you think, I can't do it anymore, God fills you back up. He fills you back up. Investment begins with time. It risks personal hurt. 
trusting God for the results and multiplication that you may never personally see. Got to trust God. God's word never returns empty or void. God's word, the gospel, does its work. It does its work. Secondly, not only should we focus on the qualities of an invested disciple maker, but focus on the qualities of a devoted disciple maker. He's going to draw three pictures here for Timothy. Verse 3, share in the suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to please the commanding officer. When someone enlists in the army, when someone enlists in the service, they are committed, devoted to following the commanding officer. When you become a follower of Christ, he becomes Lord of your life. Devoted to him. What makes him happy? What, what pleases him? What does he want? It, it's important to know. And it's important to know that that's what he's called us to. Because a soldier will sacrifice personal desires. For, a soldier will sacrifice cultural approval and trivial pursuits. H how many trivial pursuit game players we got in the room? One? Anybody else on this side? Two? Three? That's it? Man, the first service was like half this crowd and they had dozens. We, we used to sit, uh, uh, when I was in high school, we would sit in the library at noon with the quiz bowl team and we would play Trivial Pursuit. Someone would just sit there, question, 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 question. Crazy. It had nothing to do with science, math, language, literature. It didn't have anything to do with it. But sure enough, at some point in every quiz bowl competition, they would ask some silly, off-the-wall Trivial Pursuit question. It could make the difference, winning and losing. Do you know what's really true about that? As we would sit for hours and just, we would look for new Trivial Pursuit games to have new questions. Look like that dude on the Jeopardy commercial who just answers the question before, you know, you, some of my friends would start answering before the question was even asked. And like, here's the thing. Those questions, Trivial Pursuits, those, those questions never changed anybody's life. And a good soldier focuses on the things that matter to his commander. And what matters to the commander is, is what changes people's lives. I I'm just finished up the book of Romans. I've been journeying through the book of Romans in my own devotions for months now. And I finished it up this week. And it was so interesting in chapter 14, 15, 16 uh, of the book of Romans that the Apostle Paul in Romans really talks so much about not getting tangled up in quarrelsome opinions. I, I know what that looks like. I, I know I had a close relative who was, uh, all that. every time they would go to a Bible study or something, they would ask questions they already knew the answer to just to see if you did. You, you know people like that? The, the trivial things. And the Apostle Paul says, don't get engaged in that. All that does is trip people up. What matters the most? What are the most important things be a good soldier verse 5 also if anyone competes as an athlete he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules the apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7 has already told Timothy to discipline himself for the purpose of godliness he says that it's not a bad thing to physically train to, to work your body it's not a bad thing to discipline your body that's not a bad thing but discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness that's what lasts that's what's most important and he says play by the rules it, it doesn't matter if you finish the race and win a thousand people to faith in Christ and you didn't play by the rules you don't get the prize for not playing by the rules in, in 1912, one of the greatest American athletes of all time, Jim Thorpe, won uh, the Olympic gold medal in two events. The pentathlon, so that's f five events, and then the decathlon, which is ten events. 
in the same Olympics. 15 events he had to compete in. That's rugged. Can you imagine training for all of that? I, I can't imagine. And you know what? For like three months, he played minor league professional baseball in Rocky Mount, North Carolina and got paid 15 bucks a game. And they took his medals away. All of that training, all of that preparation, and he lost it. I, I thought about our own Susie Button, who did the Ironman in Hawaii yesterday. Whew, made me tired thinking about it. Eight, eight hours to complete yesterday. I saw a picture she posted, I think it was maybe Thursday or Friday. She s swam to the buoy out in the ocean, and there was a picture of the buoy. And you, you know, you, you could get through all of that, finish the race, but like if you go touch the buoy and go back instead of going around the buoy, you lose. Seems like a trivial little rule, right? But it's the rule. And see, sometimes what we do is we forget that God cares about how you play the game. That's what the text says. You, you, how you play the game, how you run the race matters. Wouldn't it be horrible to think you did so well and God says but you didn't play by the rules that's just that's discouraging and the apostle Paul's telling Timothy not, not only be a good soldier and be, be committed be devoted to that but be devoted to disciplining yourself and running by the rules and here's the thing the guidelines God has for us to live by are not to harm us but for our good but sometimes what can happen is we can start saying, well, if I take the shortcut, I can perform better. And God's like, no, 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 no shortcuts. It matters. And he says, verse 6, the hardworking farmer ought to be the first to get a share of the crops. You, you can't be lazy and be a good farmer. There is no place for laziness in being a good farmer. And a good farmer understands that it takes cultivation of the soil. He understands that it takes planting the seed. He understands that it takes fertilizer. He understands that you got to go weed. I don't know about you, but there are a lot of times I need some weeds pulled in my life. It just feels like it's choking me. In order to see the harvest, you got to do all the work, and it's a process. But the thing about a farmer is this. They understand a good farmer understands that he can't control or she can't control the outcome. That you do all of it, but the outcome depends on God and God doing his thing. And so you can do all the hard work and then you still got to trust God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone can boast. When it all comes down to it, you can't claim any credit. Only God can change the life. You do the things of a devoted disciple maker. And, and this is the thing I love about farmers. Farmers get really like excited when they come out one day and there are little rows about that tall. My dad, my dad used to come and get me and make me go walk to the garden with him to see his plants that had just poked through. You gotta see this, son. He would be so excited. I am not a farmer. I played one on TV as a child. But, he, you know, I would hoe the corn. I would. He would make me sucker those tomatoes, hill those pumpkins, pick those green beans. He would get so excited to see those plants come through the ground. And then he understood. I do what I can do. Only God brings the results. It's crazy. And then he says, verse 7, Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. The word here, when I think of consider, that to me means like 
Give it some passive thought. The word here means to seek diligently. Let it change your life. Let it impact your life. Just like James said in 1 5, James 1 5, where he says, if you, if you lack wisdom, ask God who will give it to you liberally, who, who will give it to you in a flood. God wants you to understand. The text here says, look for what this looks like. Pursue what this looks like. Pursue these pictures with your own life. That's devotion, not passiveness. When I read this, I was reminded of back in the 1980s. Uh, some of you may remember uh, Chuck Swindoll. He's one of the, probably one of the greatest preachers of, of this generation. And Chuck Swindoll wrote a book that said this. This was the title, Living Above the Level of Mediocrity. God is not looking for passive disciple makers. He's looking for intentional, investing, devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And here's the reality. Here's the reality. Being a devoted follower of Christ equals being a devoted disciple maker. And, and please, let this challenge you, not discourage you. If you think you're a devoted follower of Jesus Christ, that you love Jesus, yet you're not making disciples, that doesn't line up with an equal sign. As Peter said, I can not help but talk about, but not speak of what I've seen, heard, and experienced. Let God use that in your life. He's really challenged me with that. I can't call myself a devoted follower of Christ if I'm not pursuing him and his purposes. Does that make sense? Someone who says, I just want to know more about Jesus, but I never want to do what Jesus did and invest and do the things that Jesus told me to do is not really loving Jesus. There's no place for mediocrity in the life of a devoted follower of Christ. Lastly, we need to focus on the qualities of an enduring disciple maker. Verse 8, an enduring disciple maker. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead and descended from David according to my gospel. An enduring disciple maker, an enduring follower of Christ is regularly brought back to the truth of the resurrection. I want you to watch this. I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a big Greek scholar, okay? So I'm going to put this in real simple terms that help me understand it. The word here for risen means this. There was a point in time in history, it's the perfect passive. There was a time in history when he was resurrected, and he still is. If you were talking about Lazarus in the New Testament, you can't use this, you can't use this term. Lazarus was raised from the dead, right? So he's risen from the dead. He's risen. But what is he now? Dead. Jesus. Risen. Alive. To be an enduring disciple of Jesus Christ, an enduring follower of Christ who makes disciples, you've got to have some perspective on the fact that even when you feel empty, remember the tomb is empty. But the throne is not empty. He sits on it. He's king. He's our living Savior. And you can see past the circumstances of life, the difficulty of life, when you remember that Jesus defeated our greatest enemies in sin, death, hell, and the grave, and he sits on the throne. The tomb is empty. So even when you feel like you've got nothing left to give, you just feel like giving up, remember, Jesus is not dead. He's alive. And you have a hope and a future that is certain because of him. Resurrected from the dead. Verse 9. 
for which I suffer. The gospel, it says, according to my gospel for which I suffer to the point of being bound like a criminal. Paul's in prison. But the word of God is not bound. Paul's not an idealist. He's a realist. But he's an optimist. He doesn't deny the difficulty of the circumstance. My friend Chad, who pastors over in Dayton, is not, he's a realist. He understands the dire straits that people in his community are in. But he also sees the potential that the gospel can go forward through that difficulty, through those tragedies, and change people's lives. Because he knows that's all that really matters. When it all is said and done, a home will pass away. A restaurant will pass away. A grocery store will pass away. But our salvation is eternal. That's why it's called eternal life. You see past that. And he knows. And he knows. And he believes. Because of Jesus has defeated our greatest enemy in Satan. That Satan can't stop the message of the gospel. The great Indian from India, the great Indian missionaries always said, always said, it's the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the gospel. The greater the persecution, it seems like the greater the gospel spreads. If you look in China, some of the greatest persecution happening in the world today on believers, and they say that by like 2025, there'll be more believers in China than any other country in the world. They can't stop it. And Paul says that. Verse 10. This is why I endure all things for the elect, so they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Look, I, I know that people have debates over this doctrine of election and reformed theology and all this stuff, okay? And you can... You can do that and love Jesus, okay? And if you want to debate it, take me to lunch. At least buy my lunch if you want to debate it. <laughs> I'm happy to have that conversation. But here's the point. People are still saved by the power of the gospel. And it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching that the gospel would be spread. And the Apostle Paul is saying, just as he said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and his salvation, both to the Jew and to the Gentile. It's the gospel that saves people. It's the message of the gospel. And faith in Jesus is a result of hearing the gospel that brings people to faith. So you can get caught up in a term if you want, but... Look, that's why, that's why it's so important that we focus on the gospel. Because you can let these other things distract you all you want, and it will distract you from the gospel. Enduring requires a visionary who sees through the difficulty in light of what the gospel does. The Apostle Paul has seen the gospel change people's lives. I've seen the gospel change people's lives. I've seen the gospel and experienced the gospel changing my own life. And I wanted to change other people's lives. What about you? And in verse 11 through 13, he ends with a, this section of the chapter with a hymn. This saying is trustworthy. For, we, for if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we'll also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Isn't that interesting? If we deny him, he will deny us. But if we are faithless, he remains faithful. It doesn't say that if we are faithless, that he is not faithful. It says that even when we tend to get distracted and discouraged and question and go through difficulty and live in the fog at times, God's still faithful. Now it's important to do this in the context, to read this in the context of the rest of Scripture. But the Bible teaches, Jesus said in Matthew 
at 10.33, that if you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. He's not talking about like, like you denied being Christian one time. If that were the case, Peter would have been lost eternally right there when Peter denied him. He's saying about living a life that denies the reality of the gospel, that denies faith in Christ. For Jesus himself said that broad's the way that leads to destruction, and many are they that go there, but straight and narrow is the way that leads to life. Here's the thing. The same God who is faithful to us, like it says in, in, in uh, 1 John chapter 3, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, or the children of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that we shall be like him, for we'll see him as he is. The same text that gives us hope that God will never deny us, that God, those of us who are followers of Christ, that we've trusted in Jesus Christ, that Jesus says, no one can take them out of my hand. No one can take them out of my hand. My Father who gave them to me, no one can take them out of his hand either. And when my Father and I are one, the same God that says that, the same God who, who through Jesus said, said this in John three sixteen for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Listen to what he said. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And those who believe are not condemned. But those who don't believe are condemned already. The, the, same, the same Jesus who gives us salvation, who holds us in his hand, the same Jesus who gives us eternal life by faith in him, is the same just God who in the book of Revelation speaks about the fact that those whose names are written in the book of life will be welcomed into heaven and that we'll experience streets of gold and, and, and all of the, the presence of God, all the beauty of heaven. The same God is so faithful to his own character that he has to be just and righteous. And those who don't have the righteousness of Christ by faith in Jesus, those who haven't repented and believed, those are the same ones who said, of whom he said, those whose names were not found written in the book, Lamb's book of life, were cast into utter darkness. So just as we celebrate the faithfulness of God to us, God is also faithful. Listen, God is also faithful to his own character, to his own statements, to his own plan that those who don't trust him are condemned to eternity in hell. And you're like, well, pastor, I'm not really sure how that helps me be enduring. Oh, let that truth grip you. Let the truth grip you of the judgment of God on those who are not believers. And it'll cause you to share the gospel. It'll cause you to get past the mess of people's lives to invest in their lives. It'll cause you to go a little wacky with people just to, to hang out with them, you know? Um, I got a phone call this morning. I got a phone call this morning from someone who's struggling with some stuff that's just haywire. Anybody got friends, family, haywire? Um, it's like, oh. And, and then God brings me back to the truth about which I'm about to preach and says, hey, those are the kind of people I, you were pretty haywire when I got you. You know what I'm saying? Because we're talking about heaven and hell here. And it should motivate us. It should help us to be an enduring disciple maker because it matters, because the character of God is the foundation for faithfulness and strength. I love what J. Hudson Taylor, the missionary, said. It is not by trying to be faithful, but by looking to the faithful one that we win the victory. We finish the race and finish well, not by trying harder, but looking at Jesus and surrendering to him. 
surrendering to who he is, to know him, and to model our lives after him. That's how we finish the race well. Genuine gratitude. Genuine gratitude for God's grace motivates us to have compassion for souls and make willing, intentional investment in making disciples. Genuine gratitude says, I have to remember where he brought me from. I have to remember what he did in my life. And genuine gratitude for the grace of God in our lives will make us willing investors in others. Genuine devotion to Christ reveals itself in being a devoted disciple maker. You can't be devoted to Christ and not be devoted to what Christ is about. Well, I'm not, a, I'm not good at disciple making. Well, get closer to Jesus. Maybe let someone invest in your life. And then model that. As you see Jesus, Paul, the Apostle Paul said, imitate me as I imitate him. You know, and, and that's what he's saying to Timothy here in chapter 2, verse 2. Just as you learn stuff, give it away. Give it to somebody else. I'll give you more to give away. They ask a question you don't know the answer to, go dig it out. Ask somebody else for help. And enduring faithfulness to Christ, even in suffering, displays a confidence in the gospel of our resurrected Savior. You've got to believe God's still changing lives. You've got to believe God still changes lives. We've got to see past the mess of people's lives to see what God could make them, what God could do in them, and it will help us to endure. I read this statement by Tony Morita. Because of the importance of persevering, of preserving and passing uh, on the gospel, we must endure. And because of the hope we have in the gospel, we can endure. What God's called us to, to engage in and making and multiplying disciples is too important to not focus on it. But because of the grace and the mercy and the gift of God, and salvation he gives to us, we can. The same grace that saved you is the same grace God gives you to invest in others, to be devoted as a soldier and an athlete and a farmer, even to see an investment, to make investment that you may never see. I, I know that happens especially in high school and college, especially college, because People invest in college students and, and then they, they're gone. And you may never get to see it, but it's worth it. God's word, the gospel, will never return empty. It's too important. If you're here this morning and you're a follower of Christ, here, here's the thing. When, when you get those surveys that say, hey, would you be willing to take a two-question survey at the end of the phone call? And it always takes longer. I did one of those yesterday. It, like, was 20 questions. The two turned into 20. I'm like, yeah, th those are often uncomfortable. And my challenge to you today is, is would, you, would you give God the opportunity to do a survey of your life? Not, it, start with, are you a follower of Christ? Have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus? And if not, you can do something about that. The Bible says that whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You, you, you can take care of it. You can do that now. And if God's shown you that your need for him, it's his invitation to come and trust him. But after that, would, would you allow God to do a little evaluating in your life, to do a little survey. If, if I were to look, if, if we were to look, if we were to throw up on the screen this morning a video of your last month, the highlights of your last month, what would it show you're devoted to? I asked myself the question this week. What, what would that video show I was devoted to? My hobby? My work? My family? 
none of those are bad, but there should be an overarching theme. And what would that video show? Would you just let God do a little work? Because he's called us to not just survive, but to thrive. And to thrive personally, and when we're thriving personally in our relationship with him, that spills over. It can't help but spill over into the lives of others. I'm going to pray. Zach's going to come, and he's going to lead us in just like one verse. The altar is a safe place for you to come if you want to come and pray. If this morning you are ready, you're like, I want to trust Christ today, and you want someone to pray with you, and, and to help you or, or encourage you, I, I'd love to do that. Just come and see me or come and see me after or stop at the welcome desk and say, hey, I, I trusted Christ today and I'd like one of those next step kits. It's just a book, a couple pamphlet things to just help you and say, how, how can you, you know, get started in your walk with Christ? But, but give God a little space, a little margin in your life. Hey, what, what we're talking about this morning, what he's talking to Timothy about and to us about is way too important to just passively gloss over it. Way too important. God's got so much for you and for me. So much. Way more. Exceedingly, abundantly above all that you could ask or imagine. Father, I thank you for your, your word, how it's encouraging, how it's challenging, how you don't leave us where we are. So, God, would you, by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, would you change us for that person who's sitting here this morning who's never trusted Christ as Lord and Savior? I pray today, right now, would be the time that they would do that. Even right now, they would just repent of their sin. They would, they would tell you that they're sorry for their sin and that they would turn from following their own way and say, I put my trust and my only hope in Jesus Christ who died for me, paid the penalty for my sin, was resurrected from the dead. I trust Jesus today. God, change their life by the power of the gospel. Would you help us, Lord, to give you a little space, a little margin, so that we can get out of the fog, move on from discouragement, or even in the middle of difficulty. Help us stay focused, regain focus, for the glory of the one who focused all the way finished his course all the way to the cross. Jesus Christ, it's in his name that I pray. Amen. Won't you stand? Savior, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all of our praise, you overcame. Jesus, awesome in power forever, awesome in great is your name, you overcame. testimony everyone overcome and we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony everyone overcome So, Father, as we leave this place, we live in the victory of the resurrection, that the tomb is empty. But, God, what you call us to is to live a life, to live a life that is 
wholly devoted to you. So Lord, would you, um, just the Apostle Paul did to Timothy, will you show us a picture from your word and what that looks like in our lives, in the context in which we live, in the circumstances where we are, God, so that we could finish and finish well. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.